Yeah? Did you get my email about the homework? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. I'm a bit tardy replying to emails. So yeah, I mean, don't, don't worry about any definite dates. It's OK, right? I mean, if, if apparently, I guess 15, if we don't have class, I'll, I guess I believe you, right? <laughs> Do that week. Yeah, I mean, and again, I mean, it's not a hard deadline. I just kind of jotted the things that you should be thinking about. Don't be stressed too much, okay? I mean, if the questions are, I mean, hoping, I'm hoping it's easy, right? So easy usually is feeling better than hard, right? But, but don't, don't stress too much, okay? We will, be, we will we'll even be able to go over those questions in office hours if you want to, right? So in essence, there's no. All right. I suppose let's try. So here's what we talked about last time, and let's just briefly review it. So usually what the emphasize quite significantly is this property of complex functions as mappings. In other words, you just think about the geometry of complex analysis. So we have the function f from some region of C. So region, we're going to see later more definitely why do we say that it's an open and connected set. So in that region, the function can be viewed as f equal to u plus iv. So in other words, there is the real part of the function and the imaginary part of the function. And there is a natural relationship with this, of this function with a function of the form. So a real valued function. And it would be f of x, y equal to u, x, y, v, x, y. OK? And we say that, and that, by the way, is true not necessarily for holomorphic functions. This is true for all sorts of uh, complex valued functions. You can just represent the real and imaginary part. So. Then we defined uh, the notion of holomorphic functions. Holomorphic means that uh, for all z belonging to omega limit as h goes to 0 of f of z plus h minus f of z over h, this limit exists, and uh, it's unique, and it's given by f prime of z. So when you talk about, and that's really because of the geometry, when you talk about differentiation in uh, the complex variable sense, you usually don't care about differentiation only at one point. You want differentiation at this point and in a neighborhood of, it, uh, of this point. So that's why we want differentiation on open sets. You will see, again, with the picture what? So this, this uh, can be interpreted as follows. This limit can be now interpreted as saying that f of z plus h plus, oh, sorry, f of z plus h is equal to f of z plus h times f prime of z and plus some function phi of h, where, uh, where limit as h goes to 0 of phi of h over h in absolute value is going to 0. So in other words, what we're saying is that if you're familiar with this notation, I always confuse if it's big O or little o, but phi of h is of order h squared, 
What it means, in other words, is that it will tend to 0 just like h squared tends to 0 or faster. Right? So, um, why is it, uh, so, so what does this interpretation tell us? So if we select a microscopic, if we select a microscopic H, if H is microscopic, you can say that F of H is pretty much zero. You, you cannot even see it, right? If, it's, if you really strain to see h, you will not be able to see f of h because it vanishes much faster. If you just take a square of a tiny number, it's so enormously smaller than the number itself, right? So if you have this, this uh, feeling for it, you understand that this number just vanishes. And that means that f of z plus h is going to look like f of z plus f prime of z times h. So it looks like a linear map in h, like an affine map to be precise because you shift it a little. So in other words, uh, if f prime of z is to be represented in, in its polar form, so in its polar form this would be r e to the i theta, where theta is the argument of this complex number and r is the modulus of that complex number, then uh, we get the following picture. So we have the point z here, and this is the vector h. Under a microscope, we, see, we are seeing this. So this is the vector whose magnitude is h, and this is just some particular h you pick, you fix, right? h is now a two-dimensional vector, so you can rotate it everywhere you want. And then, so h makes the angle sigma, let's say, with respect to the horizontal. Then, provided it's really tiny, and I apply a holomorphic function, what I get is so somewhere over here, I don't know where it would go, I guess here. So that would be f of z. And what I will see is. I can translate this vector for a moment. This is the vector h, so it still makes angle sigma. And next to it, I will draw where this vector is going under the image f. So it will be rotated by the angle theta. Because you see that I take h and I multiply by f prime of z, right? So we, we, we spoke about what it means to multiply by complex numbers. Again, I mean, if you haven't seen this formula, this is going to be the natural, um, the, the, the base of the natural logarithm, but we don't yet know that, right? Right now, we, we, just, uh, we can think of it as just uh, a shorthand of cosine plus i sine. In other words, just the polar uh, form. So what is, what is going to be the length of that vector? r times the magnitude of h and the rotation, OK? So what you are seeing is that, uh, that what, what the function is doing locally, microscopically, right? There is imperfection in it. You see that there is this error, right? But if, the, but if you select microscopic h, the image is as if the vector is just expanded, amplified, and twisted. So in visual complex analysis, uh, the word that he is using is amplitwist, really nice word. So that means that f rotates microscopic vectors
by theta, I mean vector center dot z with tail. Z. Uh, and expands these vectors by R. Okay, that's what it's doing to those vectors. And of course, uh, the, the base of the vector, the point, is switched from being at Z to F of Z. Okay, so if you understand this, you understand a lot of the theorems that will flow out, right? And we'll begin examining them uh, first on the intuitive level, and then we just will try to also prove them. You understand a lot of the structure that flows out. May I erase this part? Okay. I mean, the, 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 there is a numerical sense for that, and the, we have actually an expert on that here. Yeah. But um, but the idea is that you are just gonna just gonna just gonna make the vector shorter and shorter and shorter, and at some point, eventually, that's the property of those things. Eventually, you are not able to distinguish uh, what's happening to this vector from this uh, combination of expansion and rotation. So uh, eventually, just pretty much, it, it's an imperfect. It's actually gonna deform the vector possibly make it a little bit twisted, but you're not going to notice that. Yeah. When you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in like a, uh, to a smaller and smaller regions, then it's going to look more and more like what we described here. Okay? So let's just uh, see if you, uh, if you uh, follow that. So uh, we're going to see, first of all, that we're going to see shortly is that if F is holomorphic, then uh, then the function F, which is just uh, given as U V, it's 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 made out of the imaginary parts and the real parts. Is differentiable in the real variable sense. So we're going to make a, we're going to give a proof of that. But uh, before we, uh, we we do this proof, let's just investigate what's let's investigate what this rotation implies. So I can think of the action of a differentiable map from R two to R two like this. So we have. A tessellation of space by squares or by rectangles. So this is uh, some rectangle here. Let's call this rectangle R. And let's suppose we have this angle from this small dx to this i dy. So this angle is counterclockwise. Now suppose that I take the image of it under some differentiable g. In R2, you can drop the i. Huh? You're in R2, so you can drop the i. Uh, no, I mean I, I mean that this I mean this vector together with direction. So I, what I mean is the, by dx I mean like like dx comma zero, and by i dy I mean zero comma d, uh, dy. That's really um, what I mean. Yeah, by I was that. just saying because you know that's you know in R two, so you can you can drop the i. I mean you know the, the direction. Well, if you if you prefer, okay, I'll drop the i. <laughs> Who am I to argue? Right, but what I mean is I, I mean vectors together with their sets. Dx then represents only its length. And dy represents the length of the other one, right? 
I mean, there, there is a fancy way of doing it in differential geometry. I mean, you speak about local coordinates and all that stuff, but really, intuitively, what they try to formalize is this, right? It's dx is a small, it's a small vector, microscopic. dy is a small vector, microscopic. So we have d, g is just differentiable, just differentiable, okay? And then I want you to tell me, well, suppose that its image is something like this. And let's say the, the angle is going this way, suddenly, right? So in other words, you see that this, uh, this was mapped here, and this was mapped there. So So my first question is, could this g be a holomorphic function? Let's just, uh, let's just uh, see. Let's just take a vote. I want to see what you think. And don't be shy about it. Don't, don't really worry about it, especially not with me. So a uh, vote. So G holomorphic. I mean possibly. I don't mean you cannot ascertain, but let's say possibly, right? Or you look at it definitely not. So that's very important. By the way, yeah. So what do you prefer? Which category do you like more? How many say G is holomorphic? Please raise your hand. A high, very high, G could be holomorphic. Yo! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten people say it could be holomorphic. Yeah, there's one thing though. For G to be holomorphic, both uh, the domain and the target has to be the complex numbers. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the thing is, again, uh, my, my point is how do you think of holomorphic maps? Think of this new definition in exactly the same way as you did in uh, Calc 3. A holomorphic map is nothing more than a special function from R2 to R2, OK? So that's what one, one thing that uh, we're going to make a point out of. So I think I have 10 people. How many of you say, no way? No way. <laughs> Nobody dares to say, no way. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, you. You ensured me that I'm not wasting my time. Right? I was worried. I mean, uh, because I sometimes look at, uh, at people here, and I think maybe, like, what is he doing? Is it, is it really a graduate course or not? It's hard for me to judge, right? I don't know what's a graduate course, honestly. That's the first time I teach it. I don't know why also, right? But uh, anyhow, the answer is no way. It could not possibly be holomorphic. No possible way, right? So the answer is, so g is differentiable, is differentiable, but not holomorphic. Now let's understand why. It's a very simple consequence. What, what's wrong with this, right? So, uh, so first of all, why would I say differentiable? This is a picture. This is, I mean, obviously by a picture you can attack me and say it's not rigorous and uh, it's a graduate course and what are you doing, right? But, uh, but this is a picture, okay? We took a rectangle. We took a rectangle, right? So what is the action of a linear map on a rectangle? Do you remember linear maps? If, if you don't, you, I actually have videos on linear maps for Calc 3. Yes, you can look at it, right? Uh, the, the way intuitively you think of linear maps, linear maps are just acting separately on the x and y coordinates. So what a linear map is capable of doing, that's why it's called linear map. One of the reasons it's called linear map is it's able to stretch any of the vectors, any of the uh, coordinates, the x-coordinate or the y-coordinate. Remember that statement in linear algebra that 
A linear map is fully determined by its action on a basis set of vectors. That, what does it mean? It means that if you know what the linear map is doing to the x-axis and you know what it's doing to the y-axis, you know everything about the linear map. Now what can a linear map do to the x-axis? It can make it longer and it can twist it. And making shorter, I mean, that's another way of making it longer, right? But in the opposite direction, right? So basically what you think of uh, in, when you do linear maps, you think of a flexible rubber coordinate system that will be stretched uh, that would, would be stretched and uh, the angle of the axis can be folded. That's the way you can think of it, right? So each of those pencils is made of very uh, flexible rubber. I can stretch each of them or compress and I can fold the angle between them. And that's what a linear map does. So if it's non-invertible, it will crush it to one line or crush it to a point, okay? So linear maps map rectangles to parallelograms, because they must map parallel lines to parallel lines. That's, that's a property of linear maps. Parallel lines will always be mapped to parallel lines. So those two things are parallel, those two things are parallel, okay? That's what linear maps do. So this, is, this looks like an action of a linear map, because a rectangle was deformed into a rectangle was deformed into a parallelogram. I mean, by a picture, you cannot truly judge, but I mean, uh, it's definitely plausible. It's a linear map. I told you it's differentiable. The idea is that this is microscopic. OK, make sense? Now, what went wrong? What did we prove about holomorphic maps? What are they doing to each vector? They, uh, they say, say it again? The angles basically change. Uh, each, 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 uh, each line changes. The, basically, they, they, they rotate. So this vector will be rotated. This vector will be rotated. If you draw any vector in the middle of this parallelogram, it will be rotated. By how much will it be rotated? By exactly the same amount. You see, that's what we proved. Because remember, it's going to be rotated by f prime of z. If this point is z, this is again, I mean, you see, you should develop the idea that pretty much R2 and complex numbers are, is exactly the same structure. This, the space of R2, the vector space of R2, once you endow it, with vector multiplication, which is, which is a multiplication by complex numbers, that becomes your complex field. Okay? So this point is your z. Now this point here is your g of z. So what must happen? If each vector is rotated by the same amount, then the magnitude, the, the angle between the vectors must be preserved. But not only preserved, it must re retain its sense. In other words, if dx had to be rotated counterclockwise to get to dy, then the image of dx, here it is, let's say, right, must also be rotated counterclockwise by the same amount. Because you see, basically what, what, what the map is doing is just each vector. Here is what, what, a, what a complex differentiable map is doing. Right? So it multiplies by f prime. So this is multiplied by f prime. That means rotation and expansion. And this must also be rotated by exactly the same amount and expanded by the same amount. So in particular, complex differentiation is the same as a linear map that preserves similarity. Okay? So you should think of complex differentiation as linear map that preserves similarity. In other words, the shape has to retain its features. Uh, of course, unless f prime of z is equal to 0. That's the exception. If it's 0, it crushes the entire thing to, to a point. But you can think of each point as, uh, pre again, preserving similarity. Without loss of generality, you can think that it's an, now an invisible shape. right? It's, it was crushed, but the point is now the shape of a star. Okay. So in other words, this rectangle can only be mapped if it's very tiny. We, we actually haven't investigated the, the, if it's bigger rectangle, but if it's microscopic, it must be mapped to a shape that looks exactly alike, exactly a rectangle with the, with the same proportions. You understand? So it's just like, a, like this function g, but it has to retain proportions. So um, here is a picture. So once you, if you understand this, it, it reveals a lot about what those functions do.
Okay, you understand? So this is, this is holomorphic. That's a picture of a holomorphic map here. Because what it does, it takes this rectangle and makes it into a rectangle that is just similar. It's, it has exactly the same shape. If, you, if I draw a smiley face here, there would be a smiley face which preserves its proportions. Just a scale and rotated version of the smiley face, OK? Make sense? Geometrically, when you do complex uh, analysis, you can read some part of chapter one in uh, visual complex analysis to see that better. What you're really investigating, you're investigating uh, the motions in Euclidean geometry. In Euclidean geometry, you take a shape, and you expand it, and you, put, and you rotate it, and you move it around. Right? That's, that's the uh, operations that you do in Euclidean geometry. And, uh, and complex uh, functions, they locally preserve those motions. Okay. So let's see some uh, consequences. I guess before we see those consequences, let's actually talk about uh, the Cauchy-Riemann equations, since they follow immediately from the definition, right? We just kind of, uh, we actually, I drew you a picture of why they follow from the geometry, but we will do it right now analytically, I guess. And maybe I'll repeat the geometric argument if you want. So, so the Cauchy-Riemann equation. So. First of all, suppose that limit as h goes to 0 of f of z plus h minus f of z over h is equal to f prime of z. OK, so we, we have this thing. So what does it mean? It means where h is now h1 plus i h2. Right, it's just a complex. What, what all this means again? Again, you, you're free to think of it as just h1, comma h2. I is just a placeholder. Okay, it's just a, it's just to indicate that we are dealing with vectors that have multiplication. Okay, so we have h is uh, is h1, h2, and regardless of which direction we approach zero from, we get the same number of prime of z. So what does it mean? So what I can do is I can uh, approach. I can say that f prime of z is then, in particular, equal to approaching on the x-axis. Limit as just h1 goes to 0 of f of z plus h1 minus f of z divided by h1. Do you recognize what this thing is? This looks exactly like the partial derivative in calc 3. Right, just replace uh, this function by a function of, um, well, by, by a function from R2 to R2. And just notice that H1 only modifies the x coordinate here. So this is the partial derivative of f with respect to x at z, which for simplicity we can also denote as f sub x at z, or even when we ignore it just as f sub x. So you see what we, what we observed is that the derivative with respect to the complex variable sense is just the partial derivative of the function f at x. Okay? But we can try seeing what happens if I approach on the y-axis. If I approach on the y-axis, I observe that f prime of z is limit as i h2 is approaching 0. And that would be f of z plus i h2 minus f of z over i h2. I divide by that same thing. Now what do I observe? What is this thing? I can factor out 1 over i. And then once I factor 1 over i, what does this look like? Partial of y, exactly. Do you see that? Again, 
uh, think about z as x, y. Think of it as x, comma, y. And think of adding i, h2 as just uh, having 0 and h2 in the second coordinate. That's really what this means. Okay? So this is 1 over i, the partial derivative of f with respect to y at z. Okay? And what we now observe is that they must be the same. They must be the same. Okay? So the Cauchy-Riemann equations can be stated as, uh, well, let's, let's actually write this as f1 over i, fy of z. So what we now have is that So the, the statement is that f of x is equal to 1 over i f of y. That's the Cauchy-Riemann equation. All right, I, I can analyze what it implies about, about the real and imaginary part of this function. So what do we know? We know that f is equal to u plus iv, right? Where u is the real part and, and v is the imaginary part. Again, uh, if you remember calc 3, all that means is that f is a function from r2 to r2, so it means that, is the, that the first function is u and the second function is v. That's all it means, really. right? So we observe that the partial derivative of uh, the function with respect to x, what is that? f of x is simply u of x plus i v of x. And that's supposed to be equal to 1 over, uh, that's supposed to be equal to 1 over i f of y, which is the same as minus i times u of y plus v of y. You agree? What I do is I just, just uh, take the derivative with respect to y and then multiply by 1 over i. Yeah? Should I say more? That's good. Good? OK. So you equate the real and imaginary part. So you have that ux is equal to vy. And you have that vx is equal to minus u. Uh, so vx is equal to minus uy. So those are the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Make sense? Yes? So can I ask, I'm not sure if this is going to make sense. But last semester when we derived these, yes. uh, we just went ahead with calling f, and breaking apart its components u and v. And then for some reason, we had to use intermediate value here at that point. To bring, OK. No. No. OK. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, don't, don't, you see, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, at some time, I cannot even remember what I heard about it, but a long, long time ago, it seemed, it seemed to me that it was made, uh, it was very complicated. But they, they always make it sometimes overcomplicated, right? Yeah, they make it's it, being a difficult process. For yeah, it's not. This is the point. It's not a difficult process. It's something very, very natural. That's what I'm trying to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. It's difficult because there are some books, I mean, you read it, and for some reason, it's like somebody is sadistic and they are making it very difficult, right? But it's not. It's not that difficult, actually, right? I mean, there are some really, truly difficult things, but if you read, uh, I mean, of course, I don't want to say bad things about him because he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing mathematician, right? But, but it seems that he, he just tortures you, right? <laughs> just, I mean, let me show you uh, one very difficult, uh, enormously and intuitive way of getting something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, Conway, um, I mean, it, it depends on the style. Conway is really, really rigorous. Very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book, but I mean, uh, it was a little bit, for me, a little bit putting me to sleep right, when I was reading it, right? But not all parts. I mean, some parts I felt uh, pretty good. So, so Stein is like, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the first time I saw Stein, like, wow, that's, that's an incredible book. I saw it in analysis, in real analysis, and I saw it in complex, and I saw it in everything. It just, that's really a really great book. Read it, you understand everything. All right. So we have those. This is the how easy it is, right? So would you like me to repeat the geometric argument that I did last time, or should I go ahead? Hmm? 
It's, a, it's simple. Go ahead or repeat the argument? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK, I'll go ahead. So this is uh, then Cauchy Riemann equation. So then, uh, in order to make those equations a little bit, um, I just, it, it, we can create this, the following operator. We can create the operator ddz. And ddz will be equal to 1 half ddx plus 1 over i ddy. So why is, it, uh, DZ, uh, why is it the derivative with respect to z? Because by the Cauchy-Riemann equations, I still have them here, right? If I uh, take the derivative with respect to x and add to it 1 over i times the derivative of, with respect to y, I get twice the derivative with respect to z. So that's why I multiply it by 1 half. And then I also define the conjugate equation we define d dz hat to be equal to 1 half ddx minus 1 over i ddy. All right? So let me just again uh, write the Cauchy Riemann equation. So we have that df dx, that, you see those two equations, they can just be reduced to one equation. It's, it's really df dx is 1 over i df dy. All So proposition. If f is holomorphic at some numbers is 0, then f is differentiable. In, I mean calc 3, differentiable. And the determinant of the derivative at x0, y0, in other words, that's the point z, is going to be the same as the absolute value of f prime of z0. Okay? So you all understand what I mean by, uh, by this capital F, right? Yeah, just, let's just uh, repeat. So what I mean is, again, here we have this little f is, So I, I, what, what I just do is I just when I think of f of z, I think of f of x0, y0, which is really capital F of x0, y0, which is u, x0, y0, v, x0, y0. Right? That's what I mean by f. And what I mean by this, uh, this is just uh, the notation in Stein for the total derivative. Okay, that's the total derivative, uh, and the determinant of the total derivative is uh, the magnitude of the complex derivative at z0. That's what this is saying. All right. So 
proof. So what we have is that First of all, if you investigate the Jacobian at x0, y0, that's going to be suppressing those variables. It's going to be the derivative of u with respect to x, the derivative of u with respect to y, the derivative of v with respect to x, and the derivative of v with respect to y. So what I can do, I can, I can do the following calculation. So I can say that the Jacobian at x0, y0 times h is really the same thing as ux, uy, vx, dy times h1, h2. And by using Cauchy-Riemann equations, this becomes so. So I can I can write it all in terms of u. So this is u x, u y, and then uh, this is v sub x, right? So v sub x is going to be minus u y. And this is going to be ux. Notice that if I take the, the, the two rows, if I take their dot product, it's going to be 0. right? And uh, times h1, h2. And that's equal to, if you, if you tra now multiply it out and then translate, uh, translate the result into complex numbers, you're going to get uh, a column vector, right? So if you now take this column vector and translate it into complex uh, numbers and uh, just uh, investigate it, then you observe that what you get is uh, u sub x minus i u sub y times h1 plus i h2. And this simply, what is this? ux minus i ui uh, can now again be by cauchy riemann equations translated to ux plus i vx times h1 plus i h2. And the result is simply this is just the derivative with respect to, uh, to z. So this is just uh, f prime of f, f prime at z0 times the vector h. In other words, the reason the total derivative exists is really you can convert this, uh, you can convert the derivative statement. If you just write out the derivative statement for the capital function f, it will translate to the same derivative statement in terms of f prime of z. Okay? Uh, I mean, in other words, uh, how do you prove that the total derivative exists out of this calculation, just to, to elaborate what it means? You can say that uh, we have limit as h goes to 0 of f of z plus h minus f of z minus f prime of z times h divided by h. This is, the, this is equal to 0, and that's complex differentiable. That's just rephrasing complex differentiable or holomorphic, OK? Now, this statement then implies that limit as h goes to 0, I can translate this, cup, this little f. It's nothing. It's all the same as big F. It's really just a, a change of perspective. This is limit of f z plus h minus f of z 
minus according to this calculation, right? According to this calculation, I can just uh, start from here and go to here. So that's minus the Jacobian. This would be capital F, sorry, right? The Jacobian evaluated uh, at, so the total derivative evaluated at h, divided by h, and that will be 0. And then uh, that implies I can just take the absolute value of all of it, and that will be your uh, total derivative definition from Calc 3. You see, so complex differentiable implies that uh, total derivative exists in the Calc 3 sense. But we already kind of showed that geometrically. It's, 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 it's a very suggested geometrically since you rotate those vectors. That's all you're doing. It's really just rotation and expansion. Okay. Now, this is, this is the first part of the proof. The next part of the proof is to explain uh, that the determinant of the Jacobian will be, in fact, the absolute value of f prime of z0. Can I erase this part? <laughs> so determinant of the Jacobian at x0, y0, in other words, it's the determinant at z. 0, that's going to be determinant of ux, uy, vx, vy. And uh, because we have cauchy riemann equations, that's the same as the determinant of ux, uy, minus ui uh, ux. So that's the same thing as ux squared plus ui squared. Agreed? You just take the determinant this times that, minus this times that, so it goes to be ux plus ui squared, and that's the same thing as you can replace, uh, so that's basically going to be the same thing as the derivative of z0 squared. Let me explain to you why that must be geometrically. Okay, that, that would be more obvious. This is just a calculation. And why, is it, uh, why does it have to happen geometrically? What is the determinant signifying? The determinant is what? Area. Area, right? The determinant is related naturally to area. Definitely if it's sense preserving, right? Determinant is negative area if it's, uh, if, if it's uh, sense uh, reversing. So basically, if I take one vector, let's call this vector A, and I take another vector, this is vector B, and I have the angle between them, the angle is theta, uh, you can think geometrically that determinant of AB, this is just uh, the magnitude of the vector A times the magnitude of the vector B times sine, sine of the angle between them. Why is it sine? Look at it. What's the determinant going to calculate? It's going to calculate the 
area of this parallelogram. Now the area of this parallelogram is base times height. The height is given by a sine theta. Okay, where where you see if if the angle is counterclockwise and it's uh, and it's not uh, obtuse, then it's going to be positive. You know, otherwise it's negative, etc. You know that type of thing, right? So this is uh, this is uh, one way to. I mean, I, I define it differently in calc three. I have a whole lecture on that if you want to see the geometric determinant, right? But one way that people define it is the, uh, like sine area. You don't you can take absolute value of it, but that would be the absolute value of the determinant, right? Okay, so that's what what geometrically determinant is calculating. Now, for the uh, for the Jacobian, now the reason it should be f prime of z zero squared will be clear, very clear. Look at this. So I take this is of length dx and this is of length dy. I take a square. So we can say that dx is equal to dy. In other words, that's the same length, right? I take a square. And it's, it's, it's microscopic. That's why I have dx, dy, right? And I apply f to it. So if I apply f to it, dx is going to be mapped to some vector here. What, what's the, can you name this vector? What is this in terms of dx? This vector is, what, what is it in terms of x? Do you know? You say I shift along this line, and that means I'm shifting along that line. How do I describe this vector? No, I mean in terms of f. Well, it's the partial derivative. This would be the partial derivative. Uh, let's actually write it like that. fx times dx. It's the partial derivative at this point times dx. If this point is z, so that would be at z. Okay. You understand what it means? Because if you displace by dx, what does it mean? It means that uh, you have uh, f of the, the length of this vector is f of z plus dx minus f of z. Right? Why do I know that? It's because look at it. Uh, this is this point here is z plus dx, and this is z. So this vector is uh, z plus, uh, so the length of this vector is dx. But when you move along it, you have f of z plus dx minus f of z, right? Which is what? Which is approximately the same thing, approximately, right? Uh, the same thing, but we are assuming a lot. I mean, we're assuming continuity. We're assuming things that are not yet, yet rigorous. We don't know that the, the, the derivative is going to be continuous. But for the, for the sake of picture, we can say that this is the same as dx partial derivative with respect to x. You agree? Because I divide by dx and multiply, and that's how I get it. OK? Make sense? Now, what can you say? So they are the same length. What can you say about uh, the length of this uh, vector here? First of all, this is 90 degrees in the counterclockwise sense. And because uh, holomorphic maps are just rotating and, and uh, stretching your vectors, then this is going to be of the same length. And that would be, what's the equation here? It would be dy uh, f of y at z. OK? Now, by how much have I stretched? Uh, um, by how much have I stretched my vector? In in terms of magnitude, right? So, so you can see that uh, amount of stretch. So area, uh, the area difference. So area uh, area here is so just I should say maybe like this. So area here is equal to dx dy, mm -hmm. right? Area here 
Yeah, so this would be dx dy times f sub x times f sub y, right? But in terms of, you see, if I, if I just want the area, I should probably take it in absolute value. That's the, uh, the amplification in area. So f of x, f of y, f of x and f of y in absolute value, they're just uh, the derivatives uh, with respect to z. So that's the same thing as f prime of z0. That's from here in absolute value times the absolute value of f prime of z0. Since taking derivative with respect to y, if I just multiply it by 1 over i, that would be the derivative. So you see. I should have said, uh, by the way, that the absolute value will determine it to be safe. Okay. Wait, but why are you getting it twice? Or why are you getting it? Uh, because, because we have, uh, we have a stretch. Because we, we, have a, we have the dimension stretched here by fx and here by fy, mm -hmm. which is the stretch is the same. You understand? The stretch is the same. You follow? Because uh, the, the derivative it just rotates and stretches all the vectors by the same amount. So we have this dimension stretched by the magnitude f prime z, and we have the other dimension stretched by the same magnitude. Make sense? So no questions, guys. You understand, right, well, well, how this, this formula comes about. So that's why we have. Um, f prime of z 0 squared. You can drop here the absolute value, I think, because it's going to be sense preserving. It's, it's conformal rather than anti-conformal. Right? Conformal means that not only are the angles preserved, but the orientation is preserved. Right? So I think for linear maps that, uh, that preserve orientation, determinant will be positive. Right? Okay, so. So, in the context of uh, conformal maps, is it only this, you know, in the complex sense, or can you um, can, can we talk about uh, conformal maps in a like, more general setting? Well, I mean, uh, if if a, if, a, if a map is is conformal, it's going to be complex differentiable. I think, right? right. That's the thing. Because because conformal, I mean, in, in essence, what you, what you, what it means is that when you zoom in, you're you're gonna see, you're gonna see those tiny, uh, you're gonna see uh, tiny rectangles that are similar in shape. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. My question was like, you know, I you know I get what a conformal map is in this you know in this setting, but mm -hmm. like if we if can we generalize that to like a more general setting, like if we had not only a complex manifold but like any other like analytic manifold or something. Can you define a conformal map on, on any of those spaces? I mean, uh, it, the notion there is ex it can be extended, right? So the so notion of conformal maps can be extended, for example, to the Riemann sphere, right? But, uh, but right, right now, basically, you see that, that, that those uh, theorems that we established, they just follow, uh, they follow very naturally from the geometry here. So. Here is a converse to, to our theorem. So here is the question. So if f satisfies Satisfies Cauchy Riemann equations at Z zero, must it be holomorphic? That's the question. Okay? So 
If you remember from last lecture, again, uh, the Cauchy-Riemann equations can be thought fully geometrically, right? So what you do is, in essence, uh, dx can be rotated to produce dy, and therefore the image of dx can be rotated by i to produce uh, the image with respect to the partial derivative with respect to y, right? So, so the Cauchy-Riemann equations, what do they imply? See, so you remember, a linear map is determined by its action on the basis vector, right? So what Cauchy-Riemann equation implies is that the x-axis is mapped to a vector that can be rotated counterclockwise by 90 degrees to the vector that, that the, the function maps uh, that the function maps the y-axis. You understand what I'm saying, right? So here was the the original uh, rectangle, and here is the image of dx. And then what the Cauchy-Riemann equation is saying is that the image of dy is here. Perpendicular and counterclockwise. Okay, so knowing that is the function holomorphic. Yes, as long as it's as, as long as the function is differentiable, right? That's pretty much what's, what's the consequence. Because remember, there are, there are kind of uh, we, uh, weird cases where you have the partial derivative with respect to x and you have the partial derivative with respect to y, but the function fails to be differentiable. So the theorem is then in that in that light very natural. So the theorem is going to say uh, yes, if f is differentiable in the real variable sense. So let's uh, let's state it as a theorem and prove it. So suppose f is equal to u plus iv is complex valued and defined on open set omega. If u and v are continuously differentiable, and satisfy Cauchy-Riemann, equations on omega, then f is holomorphic. On omega and f prime of z is equal to the partial derivative of f with respect to z. Proof. So really, if you look at the statement, what is this saying? It's saying that u and v are supposed to be continuously differentiable. But that's one hypothesis that makes, uh, makes uh, the total derivative exist and uh, equal to, uh, it's related to the partial derivatives, right? So you're always able to form a matrix of partials, right? If you look into my, in, into my Calc uh, 3 lecture notes, we, 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 I speak a lot about what it means to be differentiable and how a function might still have partial derivatives and yet fail to be differentiable, right? There, there, is a, there, is, there are very natural examples of that. Right, but there is a proof that if there are those things are continuous, if u and v are continuous, it has to be um, differentiable. And that's all we need.
right? So here is how we do that. We can investigate the, the fact that u and v are differentiable separately. So what I can do is I can take u of x0 plus h1, y0 plus h2 minus uxy. And what is that going to equal? That's going to equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to x at x0, y0 times h1 plus the partial derivative of u with respect to y, x0, y0, times h2 plus the magnitude of h times phi of 1 of h. So what am I, how am I uh, getting this formula? It's actually really simple. Think about the formula for the total derivative. The formula for the total derivative is u of z plus h. That's z plus h. Minus u of z minus the total derivative. That's supposed to be my total derivative if I establish it, right? Minus the total derivative here. And by the way, I mean, I'm not establishing this. I should say that uh, we are assuming that theorem. If you, if, you, if you go back into Calc 3, again, this would, be, this would be the equation of the total derivative, provided it exists. And the fact that we assume that those functions are complex, sorry, that the fact that they are uh, continuously differentiable implies this would be the total derivative. Yes? So if you rewrite the statement, if you take this, carry it across, and divide by the absolute value of h, you, this limit, in, uh, limit as h goes to 0 will go to 0. So this function will uh, go to 0. So limit as h goes to 0 of phi 1 of h has to be 0. All right, guys, I, I haven't lost any of you. Do you understand how this works? Yep. Cool. So. I can do the same thing for v. So I can also write vx0 plus h1, y0 plus h2, minus vx0, y0. And that's equal to, I'll just, compre uh, I'll just compress it. It's a derivative of v with respect to x times h1 plus v with respect to y times h2 plus the magnitude of h times uh, some phi2 of h. And again, we have that phi2 also goes to 0. So what we're going to do, we're going to define define f. Actually, it's, it's, it's already defined. What am I talking about? It's already u plus, plus iv, sorry. So uh, what you then do is. Uh, You need to show that this function is differentiable. That limit as h goes to 0 of f of z plus h minus f of z 
over h is invariant. for any direction h. So what we have is then we have that f of z plus h minus f of z is going to be It's going to be, uh, should, uh, should I, it's going to be this equation plus uh, uh, this equation. So it's going to be u z plus h minus u of z plus i v z plus h minus v of z. I just compress so that I don't have to write the h's there. And then by, by, by virtue of, of this expansion, I can simply write this as ux at z times h1 minus uy at z times h2 plus i and I do the same for the v so that would be vx at z times h1 plus vy of z times h2 and then uh, the remainders so I can write here plus the absolute value of h multiplied by v1 of h plus i v2 of h. Okay? Now I can convert everything. We have cauchy riemann equations. So what I can do is I can convert vx and vy in terms of cauchy riemann equations. So when you do this conversion, what happens is that you are left simply with derivative of u with respect to x at z minus derivative of u with respect to y at z times h1 plus i h2. So you understand how I carry this calculation. It's, it's really Simple. You just replace the v by uh, by the corresponding uh, by by the corresponding formula in the Cauchy-Riemann equation. So you replace those things and you just factor. You would see that h1 plus i h2 factors plus <coughs> plus the remainder. And then what you do is you just divide all of them by h. And what you're left here is that here the h cancels. So what you're left with is just uh, ux of z there is an i here, minus i ui of z plus absolute value of h over h times phi 1 h plus i phi 2 h. And then when you push towards uh, h going to 0,
this is this is independent. This remains just to be u x of z minus i u y of z. And this will approach zero because this is just this is of magnitude one, but this is uh, a, a number that is bounded times something that approaches zero. So this will approach zero. So again, just before you go. What have we shown? You see, we've shown that it's uh, invariant under any h. So if we take any limit uh, from any direction h, you see that what you end up is just the expression, the partial derivative of u at z minus i times the partial derivative of u at y of z. So in other words, that limit must exist, and that must be the derivative. You see, that's the idea, that whenever every h you attack with, you get the same number, and that's the number you get. Okay.